All right. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, again, my name is Edward Evans. I am um, a staff scientist here at LOSI uh, with Kevin Elisari, and LOSI is a laboratory of optics and computational instrumentation. And I'm also a developer on the image team uh, with Curtis Rudin and uh, Gabe Selzer, who's over here with me, and also Mark Heiner. And today I'm gonna talk to you about PyMache um, and uh, what PyMache is and how maybe you can use it in your image analysis workflows. So PyMache uh, is, if I can get this control here. What is PyMache? PyMache is a library that offers integration between ImageJ2 and Python. And so um, what it's not is a, an entire rewrite of uh, ImageJ in Python. In fact, when you run PyMageJ, you start a special uh, Java environment that's integrated with Python, and then you're running uh, the Java, the same Java code base that you would if you were to start Fiji locally from your desktop. So some uh, PyMache offers some um, pretty cool uh, uh, features that I think you might be interested in. So the first is it's full support for the original ImageJ API in data structures. So if you have uh, macros or workflows that use Image Plus, you can still use those, but you can use those from a Pythonic way. Um, it has a rich API uh, for interoperability uh, to help you move your data that might be a Java object into the equivalent Python one. Um, it has support for GUI in interactive mode and headless mode. There is a caveat there. There is a limitation with interactive um, sessions on Mac OS, and that's due to uh, Mac and their particular uh, way they, they deal with threading um, in Python. Uh, I already said this before, but the support for existing ImageJ macro scripts. So if you already have something you've already written in ImageJ or Fiji macro language, um, you don't have to uh, change that in any way. You can still run that same script and incorporate it in your workflow. And then of course you have access to the entire Python ecosystem at the same time. Um, and I like to think also we have a pretty robust configuration option for uh, a PyMJ. So you can still that designate how much RAM you want to use for the JVM if you're doing some kind of big data analyses or if you're scaling on a server type infrastructure. So who is this for? Um, PyMache, I think, is for kind of everybody. I'll be honest. I think everyone should code. Everyone should <laughs> should uh, be using technology from, from this level. But I understand that not everyone uh, might understand that this is for them. So I think PyMache is for researchers uh, like myself. If you have some skill a little bit, you're not too afraid with uh, a little bit of Python. Uh, and uh, also, I think, for other users who are using other packages like scikit-image. So researchers and users get absolutely benefit from this. Um, pretty much anyone that has a need where they're looking at something in uh, Python, right? And they want to use a, a plugin or a feature in ImageJ, or maybe the opposite. They have something that they've opened up in Fiji ImageJ, they've got a workflow there. And let's say they want to use CellPose or, or some other kind of cool segmenter. Um, PyMache kind of helps you get to that, uh, that, that space without you know, maybe duplicating some code that you don't need to, right? Um, and also just for me, I, I, I say anyone that really wants to interact with ImageJ in a Pythonic way, uh, PyMache is for you. For, for developers, I think PyMache is also uh, useful if you want to just bring ImageJ Fiji plugins or uh, the image processing features to your project. So we have some examples, uh, Napari ImageJ, there was a wonderful, um, workshop earlier this week by Gabe Selzer, who demonstrated how you can interact with Napari via, or I'm sorry, you can bring ImageJ into Napari via Napari ImageJ. Uh, there's also the run ImageJ script plugin, which is in the cell profiler. So if you have a cell profiler workflow that requires a macro um, or a script you wrote for ImageJ, you can use the run ImageJ script. There is also the run macro script in cell profiler, but that's slower because it actually writes to disk run image script avoids that because it leverages pi image j and you can no longer have to worry about writing your data to disk which can take some time okay so let's just quickly talk about the architecture and then i'll tell you what we're going to talk about in this workshop and then move into the workshop so this is how a pi mache works it uh it leverages this project called jpipe oops here we go so this guy here this is the heart of it so when you start pi image j you get of course the python libraries that interface with with um, the the JVM but uh, how that works is through jpipe 
So it initializes um, JPyte, JPyte creates a JVM that's integrated in Python, and that allows you to send data back and forth uh, through that pipe. So uh, you get a, an encapsulated experience where you run, or you're able to run the native Java code base and then move data across, which is really, really nice. So the end result is you get this one environment where you're running scikit image and TensorFlow, um, and you're also uh, able to access TrackMate and uh, other, uh, not products, but other uh, features or plugins in ImageJ. So um, the documentation and the tutorials I'm going to talk about today are located here, which uh, is the pi.image.net website. And I'll, I'll take you there in just a second, but you can see here are some snapshots from that. And the PyImageJ source code is located here at github.com image slash pi, slash pi image J. So in there, there is a doc folder, and then all the notebooks that we'll look at today are actually there. So if you grab a copy of that repository, you spin up an environment, um, you know, you might have to install a couple packages like scikit-image, uh, and you, then you should be able to run the, the same um, workflows that we'll go through today, but not all of them. Um, Okay, let's see. And what are we going to talk about today? So today I want to cover some basics. So how do you configure PyMHJ? How do you initialize it? And what are some of the convenience methods that uh, I think you might find useful to help you navigate the Java Python interface, if you will? Uh, working with images. So, all right, uh, how do you open an image, inspect the image data? Uh, you know, working with different type of viewers. So there is still the image shape viewer you can use um, because PyMHJ lets you use or supports the GUI. Uh, but you can also, of course, use that data or image data in Python viewers like Napari or um, ITK or I2K, ITK widgets. <laughs> uh, and then also I want to cover just uh, image and stack manipulation. I found this to be really powerful to be able to slice images Pythonically. Um, and then to do that with a Java image that I can then interact in some kind of plugin in Fiji. So um, I, I think that was really cool. Uh, another, the last couple of topics we'll talk about is how to run existing macros and scripts with PyMSJ, so whatever you've already written. And then uh, how do you access and run a plugin in PyMSJ? So uh, how, does, how do you do that? Because those are a little different. And then lastly, I, you know, there are other topics in the tutorials that I'm not going to cover that you, know, you definitely should take the time to look at but I'm still an image processing scientist. And so I, I kind of have to show you something I think is really cool that you can do with PyMSJ. So uh, I want to show you some real life use cases that I wrote. One is doing 3D convolution, 3D uh, deconvolution, excuse me, uh, with PyMSJ and using the image ops framework. And then something that I've been doing as of late that I find really, really fascinating, uh, which is texture analysis. So looking at hair-like features or GLCM, gray level co-occurrence co -occurrence matrices, and then looking at the correlation and difference variance texture values for um, some, some images that I have. All right, so I have uh, the chat open and I'm gonna do my best to pay attention to it, but hopefully if I miss something, you won't be too mad at me. So before I get there, let me just show you what the documentation looks like. So again, if you go to pi.image.net, you'll hit our website here. And the notebooks that I'll be talking about today um, are here. So you can click on that. And let's just let's take a sneak peek, right? So if I go to here, retrieving data from, from Java, you can see that um, everything is in here, right? And then the use cases we'll talk about today are accordingly under the use case section. So I'm actually going to talk about these two here, 3D deconvolution, and then gray level co-occurrence matrices. All right, I don't see any questions. So let's go ahead and move into um, how do you start and work with PyMHJ. So I'm going to start this notebook here and I'll put this in presenter mode. So it's big. And that looks like it's okay. All right, so here is PyMJ or a Jupyter notebook that um, will, will teach us how to, how to initialize PyMJ. So the first thing you can want to do is after you uh, have installed PyMJ um, and you have your Python environment, and again, you don't necessarily need to be in a Jupyter notebook, but uh, in this case we are. So what you want to do is import ImageJ 
And then from there, you can access the ImageJ gateway uh, by initializing ImageJ this way. So we'll import ImageJ, here's ImageJ.init, and then here you pass in some options. You don't have to pass in options. And in fact, since this is a live demo, I'm not going to. I'm just going to give it nothing, and I'm going to run this. And this line here will then print the version that we get. So what I got here is actually ImageJ2 with the legacy options enabled. That's the default configuration. I can actually uh, not do that. So I can do add legacy equals false, you know, all kinds of different things. I'm not going to actually run that. So down here in this little list here, you'll see all the different ways that you can initialize ImageJ. And we, what we wanted to do was provide you efficient and multiple different kinds of ways that you can initialize ImageJ because people do initialize it in very different ways. So the, what I just did here was initialize without any parameters. And what that does is it pulls the latest version of ImageJ2 with the legacy options enabled, um, and it copies that to you, or copies, copies it to your system. Um, and I should say that PyMache uses some backend pa uh, packages. One is called Jago, so that you don't actually need to um, manually download and install Fiji and point ImageJ to that. If you don't give it any parameters or you don't specify a local path, it'll just find the latest version or find the version that you specified and then download, uh, cache that locally and then use that to, to run um, ImageShape for you. So in fact, this one will do that if you specify a version here, in this case, version 2.14, that will also just uh, cache a local version uh, via Jago. Um, if we scroll down here to look at uh, from local installation, so if this is if I were to download Fiji and then point it to a folder, um, then in that case, it's not going to download and cache. Why would you want to do that? So you might have a special configuration or maybe some plugins that aren't in the update sites, or I don't know, maybe you modified your own plugin and you want to access that from PyImageJ, then it would make sense for you to, to point your, your initialization um, point to your, your local installation. Otherwise, if you don't really care so much, you know, you might just grab the latest and greatest, or, um, you know, if you do care a little bit more about the version, you'll specify the version. So I'm clicking around here. Let me just walk through this list a little bit. So I'm just coming from the top again. Initializing this way gives you, you know, uh, image 2 with, with legacy, whatever is the latest. This gives you a specific version of image 2 with legacy. Here is the switch for interactive mode. And again, um, you know, I'm not going to cover too much here. I'm not on Mac OS, but if you're on Mac OS, there are some limitations with that that um, you have to be mindful of. You can also specify um, endpoints if you know that you need a certain version of an ImageJ package um, and you want that in your environment, you can um, do that. that. That's a little bit more advanced. And then just the last thing, I guess, in this list, I think is kind of important to see uh, is specifying Fiji, right? So Fiji has plugins and commands, well, plugins, I should say, that ImageJ2 by itself doesn't. So yeah, if you wanted to do some binary options, for example, I, I think there might be some differences there. You, or if you're familiar with Fiji, you're going to want to use uh, the Fiji endpoint. So just specifying it this way will give you the latest Fiji, and then adding that little string here for a version will, will give you a Fiji of that given version. Okay, so some of these are reproducible, some are not. You can check out this, um, this table here. All right, so I think I've initialized it and it's fine. So what do we get? You initialize image J and you get this IJ object. What is it? What do we get? Um, and uh, I'll just make a new cell here real quick. This, this IJ is the gateway and where all the fun stuff is. So it's the net image J. Uh, image shape class. And if I just look at some of the options here, you can you can do normal Pythonic things with this, right? This is a Java object, but I'm now I'm asking what kind of functions do you have? I can see that it has image J stuff in it. So cool. So that's what we get. And um, here are some additional things that you can do with it as a sneak peek. So the image J two gateway also lets you convert uh, images. So if I run this little snippet here, let me add a new cell. What we've done is we've imported NumPy, right? I've made a little array here, and I've converted that array into 
a data set. And this data set is a Java data set. So if I, or an image J data set, if I ask for what type this is, we can see that what I got is net that image a default data set. On, on image J's end as a Java object, if you're gonna use it with image J ops, this is what image J ops would consume. If you try to use a NumPy array, it's gonna say, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and then you just have to convert it. And you can see here, by we're on, on the gateway, we have this Pi um, uh, attachment here that gives us some of the um, helper functions. So this to Java helps you get that NumPy array into this um, uh, Java, uh, Java object. Okay, um, the last thing here in terms of just initializing or starting PyMache and some configuration things you can do, I said that you can also modify the memory. So if you look here, there is this side Java module and PyMache is built on a couple of other packages. One of them is uh, Swai Java and Swai Java uh, lets you configure the JVM. So by importing Swai Java, you can do config.add and in this case, you're adding um, the JVM flag to specify that you want six gigs of memory. So if you're on a server and you've got 200 gigs you can play with, you're gonna say dash XMX 200. The important thing to note here is you need to do this before you initialize ImageJ, because if you initialize ImageJ, the JVM starts. And then if you try to tell it to use more memory, that this doesn't kind of work that way. So this needs to happen beforehand. Um, and yeah, and one more thing I wanted to say about that is you can access Swai Java two, two ways. So you can import it directly, which is totally fine. Or you, and you'll see this later in the um, tutorial here. If you do image J, I'm sorry, IJ dot SJ, you can get to it. So if I do, you attach it here. There it is. So there's Swai Java and then I can import it. So you'll see me use this instead of importing the Swai Java uh, module directly, just because it's a little easier. Okay, any questions? I'm looking, I don't see any. And I'm assuming I still am coming in clear. So let's go ahead and move into um, the next workbook. And soon we'll get into the fun stuff, which is some image processing. This is fun too, but not as much. Okay, so I talked about um, interacting with, can we have a copy of these notebooks? Absolutely. And I'll just take a quick uh, recap here. The notebooks are here. So if you go to pi.emisha.net, the notebooks are here and they're also available in the PyMache repository um, at github.com emisha slash PyMache. And if you pull that, you can, you can run those, um, those notebooks. Okay, uh, let's hop back into this. Importing Java classes into Python. So this is kind of, uh, it took me a while as I'm mostly a, a Python user and uh, interacting with Java in this way was a little strange for me. But when you're going to do a workflows where you're going to work with um, image J, you're going to also have to bring in some additional uh, Java resources or image resources. And those are often just Java classes that you'll import. So in this section, we're gonna talk about how do you do that? Um, and then how can you use those Java classes to, to do functions in, um, on your data? So just like before, what we'll do is we'll import image J. And then um, what we'll also do is in this case, import uh, J import and the J stands for Java uh, from Swai Java. So let's run that little cell here. It's gonna take a second, boom, okay. And I always like to print out the version just so that I know that it actually loaded. Sometimes uh, things happen. And so now we can also look at how much memory is available to our little runtime here. And it looks like we've got about um, eight gigs or so, right? And then, okay, so now we've got our setup. We've talked about this before. Let's look at loading some data and then loading a Java class to do something with that. So in this case, we're gonna open some data. And how am I doing that? So here's the IJ gateway. So we initialize this again up here, right? And note that in this case, I'm not specifying any kind of options. So this is headless, it's giving image shade two, I have legacy options. 
Um, so I'm just saying IJ. There is the um, IO uh, class or namespace. And then from there, I can access open and open this image. And this will open uh, this TIFF image. It also opens up uh, that in, like uh, proprietary images. I believe it's hooked up to Scipio. And what we get at the end is a data set. So this is a Java object. I can interact with this object like I do with anyone in Python, but effectively this is Java. So, um, and I can always test that. I'm not gonna test it now. You can always print the type and see what it is. So let's go ahead and display it. There is this convenience method under in the Py namespace attached to the gateway called show. And um, just as a heads up, the show method is actually hooked up to matplotlib. So you can do 2D images, but if you have a 3D image, it's not gonna understand that. Um, and so you'll often just have to just display a single slice or you might wanna use a different viewer. So in this case, the data is 2D, so it's not a problem. I'm gonna go ahead and pass this data set, which is Java, into uh, this call here. So behind the scenes, it's gonna go ahead and do a little conversion for me and make sure that it's a Python object from matplotlib and it shows me this guy. So this is a cell that has some stuff in it, fantastic. So we wanna do something to the cell. And the thing that we wanna do is blur it or apply a mean blur to it. And to do that, we're gonna use image ops, which is the um, image processing framework uh, that comes with uh, image 2 And that means I, it's, it's Java based and I need to use some Java resources for that. So the image uh, mean, the image op, for the mean filter wants three things. It wants uh, an empty image to store the data in. It wants the image to work on, and then it wants a radius, but this radius needs to be a hypersphere shape, right? And that comes from this uh, uh, Inglib2 imaging um, library. So no problem. We can use jimport to actually import that Java class. So we just give it the, the signature, say jimport, and now we've got this, this bad boy here. And so um, if we were to look at the type, this would just say it's a Java class of this type. Now I want to use this Java class to get this radius. And the wonderful thing about PyMJ and jpipe is I can use this I can use five here, which is a Python integer. I don't have to convert this into like a Java five or something like that. I can say, hey, five, no problem. And now I get a radius of five of this type hypersphere shape, which is what this particular op wants. If I just put five in here or something that's not the appropriate type, it's gonna complain. So then I hit run, okay, it doesn't mind at all. And then now I can use that convenient show method again to show the result. Right. So here it is. Here's the image that's been blurred. So, you know, depending on what you're doing, you may or may not need to import some Java classes if you're going to interact with the image shape framework a little bit more intimately. But that's not, it, it depends on what you're doing. So not all the time uh, will you need to do this. Okay. So that is working with some Java classes and then sending some data to to Java very quickly. Any any questions? I don't see any. Let's move on. So okay, you now under your belt, you know how to start MSJ, you can configure it, you can maybe set up some of your memory. You know that if you need to import a Java class, you can do that and you can interact with it in a Pythonic way. So let's talk about going the um, sending data. Uh, to Java uh, that you're probably more interested about, which would be uh, images and arrays and maybe some more primitive types like um, integers. So how does that work? First, let's start our session. So here we're going to do something a little different. We got image shape, but now I'm going to uh, activate interactive mode. And um, I do now realize that I'm in a web browser and interactive mode is going to pop out um, a, a GUI, so I might want to switch to displaying my desktop. So in a moment, I might do that. Okay, so I've started image tray here, and again, uh, we initialize it with interactive mode. I can see that I got the same version that I wanted, which is fantastic. Um, so let's let's see how Python and Java objects kind of work in this paradigm um, using PyMJ. 
So uh, first, if I look at this next cell here, what we'll do is uh, a couple things. We're going to make a Python list with four integers in it. And then we're going to take that Python list and we're going to convert it to Java. And behind the scenes, it'll, it'll do some really intelligent matching and make sure all the types are taken care of for you. Um, and then we're going to see if, if I modify this Python list, what happens to the Java list? Does the Java list change or not? Because you might think they're linked. And it turns out um, they're not, right? So when you, when you take a Python list and you send it over, a, a copy happens, and then you've got your Java object. So if you modify the Python one, that doesn't necessarily have, that doesn't modify the Java one and vice versa. Now, it's important to note that this is um, unlike what happens if you are working with NumPy or uh, X-arrays, okay? So uh, if your image is a NumPy array and you send it to Java, what happens in PyMHJ is that Java object that is made, let's say it's a, a data set, it points its memory to that Python one, so they're linked. So if you start modifying the Java one, or the Python one, you'll see changes happening. It only happens in that direction for right now. If you uh, have a Java object and then you send it over to Python and you, uh, what ends up happening is a, is a copy happens in that scenario. So from Python to Java, we can view the memory and from the other way around, it's a copy. Um, for right now, um, we are working with um, a new uh, package called the pose that will hopefully resolve that. So we get zero copy in both ways. But just know that there are some nuances um, with converting from one end to the other. In this case, one nuance is like lists and things like that don't get linked, but numpy arrays potentially could be linked. Okay, so uh, we looked at that. These are not linked. That's great. Um, and you can also, uh, how do you interact with this Java list though? So I made a Java list and a Python list. So in, in Python land, you know, you can sub uh, some call it with a bracket and then iterate through it can you do that with with java uh, java list and, and the answer is yes so if i run that you can see that i'm able to iterate that if i open this up a bit you can do a lot of things so i can say for i in java list print i so just like you would in python even though uh java list is look at that it's a java type right and you can even do len on it if you want to not lava list java list there we go four so the the type of interactions you would normally have with with python you can still do with the java um reciprocal um, in fact sometimes i get confused i'm i'm working away and i, I didn't realize that um the object i'm working with is a java all right, so let's move on to the next thing, which is um, looking at types. Yes, oh, how to uh, make certain array types. So let's say, for example, you, you are working in ImageJ and it wants uh, an array of Java integers. And sometimes if you just give it a list of integers, that will take it, sometimes it won't. Um, you can access or, or make the Java image, uh, Java objects in, uh, by using JPipe. So if you import JPipe, they have this module called JArray, and then um, also JInt, and you can initialize an object like this. And what this call is doing is making a list or a JArray of four elements, one through four, of type integer, um, and initializes that as an object. And that's a, a pure Java object, as you can see here, if I look at that. Um, so sometimes if the, the operation you're, you're using requires that, and for whatever reason, they may not um, like the, uh, the Python equivalent that you may have supplied. So just be mindful of that. Okay. So um, I'm going to check for questions. We're still doing good on time, but I do want to show you the cool stuff. So let's just move on. All right, converting numpy arrays to Java. So I kind of talked about this just a little while ago, but let's look at this. So in this cell, what we're doing here is we import NumPy, and then we're going to go ahead and make some NumPy arrays, and then we're going to um, convert them. Now, you might imagine if you have a NumPy array, and also you have a list, and if you convert them, 
you might, you know, you might get some different outputs there uh, if you use the same call. So the call that we use here is, is um, the two Java convenient method. Uh, and here you can see that uh, we're able to tell the difference between what's going on and give the appropriate type out. So if you do ijpy to call, or I'm sorry, to Java on this array that we made here, this test array, and then if you do that same call on this list, you'll get um, two different things, right? You'll get this uh, image type, which is uh, image a2 uh, default data set, and then you also get the equivalent to a Python list in Java land, which is an array list. And we can, uh, you can check to see what those things are and make sure they're not crisscrossed. So in this case, um, the default data set belongs to this particular uh, superclass, if you will. And we want to make sure that it's a random accessible interval. And you can, you can do is instance calls on that. So if I do that, I can see that my J array is in fact an image. It's a random accessible interval. And my J list is in fact not that, it's something else. So again, you can, you know, if you, whatever type of um, calls you're familiar with, with checking types, you can still do um, with, with the Java equivalents or the Java calls you put in, Java classes you pull in. Okay. So here uh, in this last little slide, um, I think this is my last one. Yes. What do I want to show you? What I want to show you here is importing uh, an image and working with it and then uh, demonstrating how that works. So from psych and image, uh, this isn't normally part of our um, build for, for PyMSJ. So if you try to run it, it might report that you don't have psych and image, so you might have to install that on your own. But uh, if you import psych and image, and then we'll open up this uh, little uh, image of this HeLa cell here in metaphase that I took some time ago, which is kind of fun, um, we can see that we can display the image. And some things to note um, about this is the dimensions of this image uh, and also that we're slicing it, right? So again, ijpy.show does not use a matplotlib as its backend. It doesn't do more than 2D. So what I'm doing here is asking for plane zero, so the first slice, and then I want channel two, and then give me my X and Y, or in this case, Y and X, because they're inverted, and then we get this guy. Um, okay, so now that we have that, we can run some ops on that and show that we can uh, make it look cool. So if I hit that, oops, I didn't run this. There it is. So here, I got scared there. So now we can use, uh, yeah, so what am I doing here? So what I'm doing here is I'm showing you that I have a numpy image. I've shown it. And then now I'm going to do some operations on this numpy image and then show you the result, right? So here's this image. I'm making a result image that's empty of the same shape. I set some sigma values. Note that these are in Python. I don't have to massage these into a J double or a Java double or something like that. Um, I'm going to use the, the dog or difference of Gaussian filter in the image state ops framework. And then what I need to do here is some convenient methods, which is, again, this is Java, right? So I need to give it Java objects. I'm going to just convert that to Java here for the result and also convert that Python object, um, this microtubule image, right, into a data set as well. And then we're going to feed in those two sigma values and it produces this, this image, right? So these two Java um, calls here, ijpy to Java, for the result, and then for the microtubule image, those are making pointers to the Python arrays and then just referencing them. So I actually didn't copy anything. I'm just saying point your memory pointer there and then do the operation. And it does. So one thing to note here is this particular op, um, when it operates on the input image, it modifies it. And so if I were to go back and show the other image, the, the, um, the uh, numpy one, you'll see that it also is, is modified, demonstrating that they're linked. Okay, cool. All right, I am moving along. Let's go to the other way around. All right, I've got 
my stuff in Java. Now I want it back. How do I do that? What do I get? And um, help me, right? <laughs> okay, so first the thing to know is um, I'll let you read this on your own because I, I am limited for time, but we do have a nice little list of uh, what type of objects you'll get back. And in section six, working with images, there's an extensive little table about if your image doesn't have any dimensions, what can you expect to get back? But um, generally, you'll see this type of conversion uh, where these random accessible images, uh, so like uh, the base image, will go to a NumPy array uh, almost always. If there is metadata, wonderful, then we'll give you an X array. And X array, if you're not familiar with that, allows you to has metadata associated with it, so coordinates and dimension information, but it also wraps at its core is NumPy. So um, anytime you have an X-ray object, if you just do a dot data um, attribute call on that, you'll get the underlying NumPy array and you get all the benefits of NumPy with that. And as you can imagine, if you look at the um, some of these uh, more primitive types here, they, they kind of go to what you would expect, right? A string will go to a string, um, a linked hash map will go to a dictionary, that type of thing. So all of these conversions happen behind the scenes for you when you do to Java and from Java. So let's let's look at some of that here. So um, we're going to go ahead and again start our session here. And we're going to go ahead and load some image. And I'm loading the image from this URL. So the um, the io.open uh, method or function can accept URLs, which is fantastic. So it opens that up. And then now I'm going to say, ah, I want this as a um, numpy image. So I'm going to say from Java. And now I've got XR colony, which is some type of, it's either numpy array or um, X array. And frankly, right now, I don't really care. If you do care, we do have a special one, uh, a two, two X array or from, or yeah, two X array as a call. So if this is, a numpy array and you really want an x-ray, you can just say 2x-ray. Um, all right, so now we show that uh, image here and we specify the gray color map so we can see that's gray. And of course we can print out some dimension information or actually their type. And you can see that these are different types. So pretty straightforward. Um, if we move on here, to some special considerations though, um, things to think about is axes. So my biggest contribution I think to PyMache is working on metadata and axes. So they have a special place in my heart. And uh, one thing to note is that it's hard to determine what your axes and dimensions are um, if there are no labels. And so NumPy doesn't support dimension information and oftentimes we have to make a guess. And sometimes those guesses are wrong, which I'll show you in a second. So if we open up a four-dimensional data set here, which is included in the PyMJ repository, and then convert that to X-Array, and then look at the dimensions that come out, we'll see that they're actually pretty different. If you look at the data set from uh, ImageJ, you'll see that the first two dimensions are X and Y, and we call them X and Y, and then you have channel time. And if there was a fifth one, you would see um, uh, Z um, somewhere. I think it's between channel and time. And you can see, of course, the shape here. If you look at the X-ray, though, you'll see that the dimension information has changed, names have changed, and also the order. So instead of you know time being t actually spelled out or X and Y, we have row and column, and these are actually flipped, right? So row is Y and column is X, so it's Y X and then channel. This is following Scikit Images' um, preferred format or um, dimension order. And we do our best to abide by that, um, but you can't always predict that. So again, if you have a NumPy array that has a certain shape that is kind of complicated and it doesn't have any dimension information, and you try to import that into ImageJ, you might get some really weird, unexpected results. Um, and I think I can show you one now if I dare to show only my screen. So let's try. Okay, share desktop, here it is. So here's my desktop that we're presenting from. So I'm gonna go ahead and load this image and uh, ooh, typo, right? <laughs> this, this is loading a numpy array and then I'm 
doing from Java on this NumPy array. It's okay. If you ever do that, like I did here mistakenly, nothing yet happens. It recognizes it's a NumPy array. We don't do any kind of processing. It just returns the array back to you. And so you'll get the same thing. So here what we can see is we have a row, column, and then a channel of three. And if we display that, that looks really nice. If I come down here, and I say ij.ui.show, so I'm going to ask the, the image J UI to show this image to me. And I think it's called Astro R. Oops. What happened? Oh, this is because I'm trying to show a NumPy array in Java. So I need to convert this first. So I'm, I'm going to say ij.py to dataset. I can also do to Java, but I like to dataset a lot. And Astro R. There it is, and it, wow, hopefully you can see this here. Oops. You can see that this image has been really, really, really mangled. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's mistaken the one of the dimensions, uh, one of uh, probably X, I think, to be three, which is the channel. And that's obviously not what we want there. So you have to be a little mindful about your order, uh, your dimension order, and um, what impact that might have moving forward. Okay, I'm going to switch back to just showing just the um, page here, and then we will move forward. And I'm running a little out of time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an executive decision and move into um, my uh, use cases, because they do involve working with images, and they do also use convenient uh, methods. And I think I might have to scratch running some macros and stuff, but you can um, absolutely, again, go through the workshop yourself or the tutorials, and you can see how to interact with macros and scripts. Um, so, but if there is some time after I move to the other stuff, I'll come back and swing to this because I do think it is important. But I think these other things are more important because I want you to see what you can do with PyMHJ and also um, uh, ImageJ as well. So let's look at deconvolution. Uh, deconvolution is, I think, something that I do all the time. Why well, do I do it all the time? It's something I think people also do all the time and they run into issues. How do I do it? Um, what software should I use? What are my settings? That type of thing. So this particular uh, use case demonstrates how to do deconvolution uh, with PyMHJ, but you don't have to use PyMHJ. It's using ImageJ2 and ImageJ Ops. So uh, let me walk you through it. The first thing we want to uh, note, though, is uh, deconvolution has a couple of different flavors, and the flavor that we're using here is we're just in Lucy TV or total variation, and the total variation um, is a spin on the regular we're just in Lucy algorithm by adding uh, a regular a regularization factor, which helps suppress noise that could be amplified by the the RL or we're just in Lucy um, algorithm. So. The first thing here we're going to do is we're going to set up PyMache and then we're going to open some data and also then grab some essential Java resources. So let's start. If we uh, see here, I'm importing ImageJ. I've got matplotlib and I'm asking for ImageJ without legacy. I don't need to do this, but why I did this here because I wanted to show you that I can do this particular operation with the latest, greatest, and I didn't need the legacy um, components. Right. Okay. So I can see I got only image J2. You can see there's no other version here. One dot five four F, which is the original image J, is missing. So just image J2. Um, you've seen this before. IJ.io.open. I'm going to grab this image from um, our site, and I'm going to show only slice thirty. So um, when I open this up, this is opening up as an image J dot net data set. I'm sorry, net dot image J data set. Um, and so its axes or dimension position is X, Y, and then Z or channel or whatever. So in this case, my Z is here, and I'm going to specify I only want slice 30, and then it show me that. So now we can see a slice of what I affectionately call the Cheeto. And again, I didn't, if I didn't say this before, this is a 3D data set of a HeLa cell, a, a nucleus from a HeLa cell that I imaged, and it's got 61 slices, and it's stained with DAPI. So it's kind of fuzzy. Um, but you can, of course, you know, make out some structures. Okay. So we can see this image here. Um, the next thing we need to do before you can um, deconvolve this is we need to generate 
a synthetic point spread function. So when you take an image and you deconvolve it, you take this image, you have a point spread function which defines how the light has been moving through your material, and you can deconvolve your image with that. So you can use a collected one that you've got experimentally, or uh, you can synthetically create one. So here, the uh, I'll show you how to do that. Um, and one other thing we'll do here before I jump to that is set some, some two parameters here. One is um, iterations, so how many times it's going to iterate through the data, um, and then a regularization factor. This value is a little hard to describe and kind of beyond the scope of this particular talk, but if you look at the paper that is referenced here, you can um, learn more about why this value is what it is. So I'm going to run that, and so I think that's, did I run this? I did. I did not. There we go. And I'm going to run this guy. Cool. So um, let's create a synthetic point spread function. I'm going to uh, be a little brief about it, but effectively what you need is everything in this table, if, uh, in which you get from your experiment. So your numerical aperture is what you imaged with, um, the emission wavelength of your sample. So in this case, DAPI is the peak wavelength is um, 457. The refractive index indices for your immersion and your sample, um, I was using oil, so about 1.5 and then about one point for my sample. These are averages that I are more or less okay. Um, you'll need your lateral resolution, so your microns per pixel, and then also your axial resolution, and then you'll also need to decide or define uh, your particle position, so how far away your sample is from the, from the cover slip. So these are the values I plugged in here and I um, got from my particular uh, acquisition parameters, and so we'll go ahead and set those. And that's all that is here. And also what we need is some Java resources. So before we talked about importing um, some Java stuff. So here I'm using ImageShade.sj, uh, and that is SwiJava and J importing. And I'm just giving these namespaces to that. And I'm, I've got these Java objects now. The ones that we need are create namespace, final dimension, and float type. The create namespace is because of a bug, which I've linked here. You can click on that and, and see where that is, but effectively I have to manually use that instead of um, using it a little bit uh, easier. And then these two other um, type Java classes we, we need for the kernel diffraction, which is how the, the point spread function is made. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and run that. I did not do that. There we go. Here. Uh, this particular operation requires all of its numbers to actually be in meters, which is, I don't think that way, and they would be pretty small numbers. So while up here we define them in uh, values that make sense to us, um, we'll go ahead and convert those to meters, and then uh, finally we'll get the dimensions of the point spread function. So because I'm using ImageJ Ops, which is in ImageJ and it's Java, um, it wants the dimensions, and it works upon this final dimension or dimensions type um, Java class. So I need to make that. And all you need to do is just give it the shape of the dimensions that you want. So in this case, I'm giving it the shape from the image, the input image, so it returns a tuple. And that tuple then gets converted into um, this Java equivalent that works well for the op. So I'm gonna go ahead and run that. And now this next step here, um, what it does is it creates the point spread function with all those variables we put in, and then from there, um, we convert that point spread function from Java into a NumPy array. Why? Because I actually want to show it to you. And uh, these last two little um, sections here, just do a little fun stuff where I display the image side by side and then also display one of the views in an axial view. Or I'm sorry, uh, an ortho uh, orthogonal view. So I'll go ahead and run that. And we'll see that looks there. So I'm going to run this too because it's going to take a second. So um, here we go. So here's the point spread function from the top down, looking through. And if you were to display this in ImageJ's GUI, which I don't have time to right now, you could scroll through it. And if you were to use the orthogonal side views, you would able to you'd be able to see the side view of that, right? And then here, uh, I'm now going to go ahead and take that point spread function and run it on my input image. So here's the uh, input image, uh, img, and this op this um, particular operation needs to work on a float type image or a 32-bit image. So I'm just going to convert that into a 32-bit 32 32-bit 32 image and then pass in 
all the other stuff that I need, which is that 32 bit image, the point spread function that we just made, the iterations, um, which is 15, and then that regularization factor. So um, after that, it'll go ahead and behind the scenes, run your um, deconvolution for you, which hopefully we'll finish in just a second. And then these last little lines here, more or less doing the same thing we saw before, which is um, displaying the input uh, image and the output image, which is the deconvolution result side by side, and then um, applying some labels on there. So I'm gonna give that just a second. Hopefully it'll finish. Um, and while that is finishing up, oh, perfect. Phew. Here it is. Here's our result, right? So here's that input image, and then here's that deconvolved result, which looks pretty good. And these are both the same slices. So that's um, how you can do deconvolution uh, using PyMHJ and also image ops, which is really cool, I think. So in my last few minutes here, I'm going to kind of quickly go through um, this other topic here, which is really expansive, and I wish I could give this more time to talk about, but um, I don't. But it's called the gray level co-occurrence matrices. It's how you do texture analysis. I'm going to skip over a lot of really interesting things. Um, but what we'll do in this work, this little uh, uh, notebook here, is take props from four of these cells, and then also the background. And then just by analyzing the texture in PyMHJ, I can identify that these cells here are um, kind of smooth and not doing anything, and this cell up here is doing something. And just to be real quick, because I used to be a virologist, uh, these cells are infected with HIV, and this cell up here is actually producing HIV particles. And then these cells down here are also infected, but um, they're not yet in that productive state. And so it's kind of important to know um, and identify is a cell producing particles or not. And I thought it'd be actually kind of interesting to do that via texture. So moving real quick down through all this other stuff here, here's, an, uh, I think, a detailed explanation about how that works. So hopefully you can, um, that makes sense to you. We're going to go ahead and start um, our session here and also import whatever um, Python objects we need. We're going to do something else that you're familiar, should be familiar with, with now. So we have MHJ. We're going to import this Java class, uh, Matrix Orientation. So you can analyze textures in different orientations. In this case, it's two-dimensional. Um, MHJ Ops actually also offers a three-dimensional texture orientation. I have not used that extensively, but um, it looks really cool. So check that out. In this case, um, I'm importing that, and then I want to just store all the different angles pretty easily because I'm going to rotate um, through all the angles as we analyze the patches. Here are some um, helper functions that will um, make sure I run that. Here are some helper functions, which are a little small or big, that will do the grade level co-occurrence co matrix, uh, matrices analysis for us and um, what they do is I, we will create a, a dictionary of crops, and that dictionary will be consumed by this process crops uh, method. And then from there, uh, each of the crops will be analyzed using uh, this GLCM or Heralic feature uh, operation at all the different angles. So we'll iterate through all the angles and then get all the numbers out. And then from there, we'll take the mean or average of those numbers. And I realized I just jumped over this. I didn't talk about what numbers we're talking about. The two textures we're looking at are correlation and difference of variance. And the correlation is a measure of how correlated two pixels are or, or a set of pixels are at a given angle and distance. Um, and so a highly correlated image will pe appear more homogeneous and smooth. And a, a low correlation image will peel, appear more noisy. The difference in variance is kind of like the reciprocal of that. It's a measurement of how variable an image is. So high values in this category means the image is really bumpy and noisy. And then um, low values here would mean that it's not highly variant or it's invariant. So we'll get those two numbers and then compute um, the average from all the different angles, which would give us a good idea of their texture, since these uh, don't have any particular orientation with their texture. And I'll show you what they look like in just a second. So let me just uh, initialize that. And then we need some parameters here. And I, I don't have time to talk about what these are, but the explanation up top is. And uh, right now I'm just setting some gray levels, which is 128, and then the distance in pixels in which we're going to do this comparison to 7. 
Um, so now let's use PyMHA to open up the data. So this will open up a 2D image that I just showed you before, and then it'll convert it to um, X-ray so we can display it. I'm just multiplying the image here because it's just a little dim. And then we can see um, the image here. So it looks pretty good. So the next thing we're gonna do is actually generate some crops. And all I did is I decided some regions here that I thought were pretty reasonable. And I also picked two spots in the background. Um, and I'm storing those crops in a dictionary. So the key will be the name of the crop and the value is that particular slice. And so uh, these are, uh, this is a data set. This is a Java data set, right? And I'm using NumPy slicing notation to get my crops. Um, and what I get in return is the equivalent to a view in ImageJane land. And so this particular dictionary contains a view of, of images. I'm also storing the minimum um, X and Y values for the crops because I'm gonna use that to draw boxes over the original image to show you where I took my crops. And then this uh, little block here is gonna just display all those crops with labels in a two by three grid. So if we run that um, cell here, we can see the crops. So um, here we can see there are a variety of different textures and uh, hopefully we can tell the difference between them. This next cell here um, displays that original image with the crops and their locations, as you can see here. And then moving pretty quickly, it's almost out of time, I'm going to go ahead and take that, use that method I talked about to process those crops and then see where they land. So you can see here, in fact, actually, I was able to tell things apart. So Saito 1, 2, and 3, and if I scroll up, come from here, 1, 2, and 3. And these are the cells that are not producing um, HIV particles. The background, um, 1 and 2, are over there, and up here they are. And you can tell these backgrounds actually are a little different. And uh, then you can see the cell that's actually producing viral particles falls in the middle of the plot. Um, and so it's actually clustering uh, a little differently if I were to have more, more numbers here. So to come back up to the image, we can see that here is Cyto4, where those numbers are different. And then just very quickly, you can tell that these two numbers are actually a little different and they have a different variance, difference of variance. So if we go back up to our grid here, we can see that, in fact, the backgrounds do look a little different. Background one has a higher, like, looks noisier, right? So its difference of variance is a little higher than um, the background number two. If we go scroll back down, we can see indeed background one does have a more grainy or noisy um, texture, if you will, to it. So this is just an example of how you can do texture analysis to um, glean meaningful information from your data um, and also how to use PyMachia. So I know I ran pretty close to the time. I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. I don't know if I can continue beyond this, but I will be happy to answer questions for as long as the system will let me. Also, thank you all for listening. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, thank you everybody. Well, it looks like I think we're pretty good. Um, yeah, check out the documents. Um, hit up the image at SC form if you ever need help. Uh, and also, if there are more technical issues with PyMache, uh, submit an issue at the repository. Uh, thank you all so much for your time and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks.